Facebook. So I'm Judy Veers, and I'm running the community meeting on preventing deaths of despair. Um, I shared a little bit this morning, so I don't want to take up too much of these wonderful people's time. So let's see. We are going Facebook Live, and we have a video camera here. So <laughs> awesome. All right, so I'll talk more about myself later, but I want to introduce, here we go, Billy. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Billy Live. I run um, a nonprofit organization called Find Your Purpose, Inc., and I also own a recording studio and booking agency called Wisdom Court Entertainment. Um, with Find Your Purpose, Inc., we're official 501 C3 under the Community Foundation of Carroll County, we aspire to elevate, empower individuals of all ages through experiential uh, learning and entrepreneurship opportunities. Um, we specialize in doing a lot of different events in the community where we work with um, not just the minority community of Carroll County, but everybody um, of all ages. And yeah, we have a lot of reach in um, the area. Hi, I'm Tina Thomas. I'm with the Infinite Love Project and BeKindSign.com and ActionForKindness.org. ActionForKindness.org is a 501c3 through the Community Foundation of Carroll County. Our main purpose and our mission is to make our community a kinder place to live. Uh, and we do that through a number of means, primarily through the spoken word and through art, um, including and some seen them the be kind signs um, this particular be kind sign is a paint your own be kind sign it's part of a kindness workshop that we're uh, putting together with the arts council and others in the county uh, including um, girl scouts schools um, other arts councils uh, where the workshop is a holistic um, bringing uh, mindfulness to a tactile activity that will remind them the feeling that they had while they were painting something that reminds them of kindness. Um, it's important to meet people where they are and bringing them into a scenario where they can let go and not worry about what's going on um, and help them with mechanisms uh, to remind themselves how to breathe and be mindful. Um, uh, help them not worry so much and be kind to themselves, then they can be kind to others. It's like, be kind to yourself, then be kind to your housemates, then take it on the road. It all starts with you. And uh, uh, so kindness is, is the outreach, community outreach that we do. Good morning. Thank you for this opportunity, first of all. I'm Jacqueline Spielman and I am from NAMI Carroll County. NAMI has been around a very long time, stands for the National Alliance on Mental Illness. It has been here since 1979. We have been trying to reform and reboot here in Carroll County. The services that we provide are support groups for family members of folks that are affected with a mental health issue. We also have support groups for called Connections, which is for the individual with a lived experience of a mental health condition. Everything that we offer is free and open to all confidential safe space. Our mission is quality of life. I'm going to say it again, quality of life for everybody. The individual, the family that is going through these hardships and the community in general. Um, we're involved in CIT, which is a crisis intervention team, law enforcement. We just recently trained eight school resource officers. We're so proud. Congratulations to those school resource officers that are now crisis intervention team trained. Um, we offer educational services, uh, family to family, an eight week course which is full, chock full of education, coping skills, interactive exercises. We actually go through some role play, learning I statements, different approaches, softer backdoor approaches when working with your loved one who is affected with a mental health condition. 
We do advocacy. We do a little bit of everything. I would say we are the jack of all trades and master of a lot of trades as well. Thank you. Hi, I'm Reverend Lisa Weddington, and I'm here as the outreach coordinator for Bryant Safe Haven. Lillian Hardy is the founder and the executive director, and Bryant Safe Haven is a consortium of, oh wow, quite a few opportunities for people who are in despair. And the whole goal for Bryant Safe Haven is to give people hope. Our primary entity is the food pantry located in Tiny Town. Of the executives in Tiny Town and on Westminster who have come to the grand tour, they are like quite amazed, blown away that they have never seen a food pantry that looks like it does, that operates like it does. Every week they give away at least 40 boxes of food to um, residents from Tiny Town, Westminster, Baltimore City. The coolest thing about this pantry is that you don't have to be a Carroll County resident. We've had people come here visiting from Ocean City and they had a great need and they would come by and get a, 40, um, a 15 pound box of food to include meat, poultry, um, produce, and um, perishable items. Presently, we have volunteers who are all senior citizens. Um, we're looking for more volunteers. We could definitely use more volunteers. Um, we also have students from um, in Westminster, Montessori School of Westminster, and our homeschool group, Home Educators Lead New Way. But we can definitely use more volunteers. Um, the food pantry itself is open on Tuesday and Thursday from 10 to 2. So when you go to the Facebook page or the website, Bryant Safe Haven, you'll get the detailed information as to when you should come. Um, do you need to make an appointment? They do have a Saturday that they um, will allow people to come pretty much because they work and they can't come during the traditional hours. But um, once every three months we have a site tour and those of you who are listening to us through this live or any of you here, you're welcome to come and do a site tour. Again, my name is Reverend Lisa Weddington and I am the outreach coordinator. And I so appreciate being a part and being invited to this um, forum. Again, Brian Safe Haven's goal is to offer hope. And I, I'll share more later um, about the founder's vision and how this came to be. It is an amazing story of hope. You're gonna wanna hear it, I'm telling you. Hi, I'm Tasha Kramer. I'm the Director of Community Health Improvement for the Partnership for Healthier Carroll County. And today we're here to talk about the CARE campaign, which is the Carroll Anti-Stigma Resiliency Efforts that was established in about 2018 and to, and to address mental health and substance use disorders and to really reduce that stigma based in Carroll County and out surrounding areas, but really focus on Carroll County and try to make those changes. Um, with the CARE campaign, we have offered things like, uh, this is my brave, a st storytelling series where people share their stories of hope and recovery we have a mental health speaker series that we are that we have been offering where people can take free classes uh, they're offered once a month and we offer free ceus for those who need those um, and we offer uh, we did an art show in may for uh, mental health awareness month uh, which we are very proud that we received an award for by the children's mental health association um, for offering that art show um, we have a lovely video on our website at healthycarol.org where you can see our care campaign video. Hello, my name is Zach Tomlin. I am the president of Tomlin Technology, the chair of the Carroll County Workforce Development Board, a board member of Together We Own It. 
and a plethora of other things within the community. Um, when it comes to mental health, I live it. Uh, I have major depression disorder. I have uh, general anxiety disorder and I'm neurodivergent. I have ADHD. So, um, one thing that's really important to me, I was also, and I guess this is the best reason for me to be here. I was a candidate for Senate, for state Senate. My main concerns were mental health, the drug epidemic and neurodivergence. There is so much going on as all these people can tell you, um, any cracks within mental health that people had po or pre pandemic COVID brought that out and exacerbated it. And we are seeing that, uh, I got into politics. Uh, I made a promise to my brother who is in and out of active addiction. He's in recovery right now. Uh, he was on life support, uh, after an overdose. And when he was in recovery, we had about a two hour conversation about the drug epidemic during that conversation. So much was said that was logical and put us on the right path. At that point in time, I told him that I promised him that I would get to a place where I could actually make an impact, work with these wonderful people and really highlight that. Mental health is a tree that from that tree, the symptoms we see, we see mass shootings, we see, uh, you know, the drug epidemic overdoses, we see suicides, we see, it, in fact, it impacts our community in so many ways and the way the drug epidemic is going, we haven't seen the edge of the ripple yet. The rock has been thrown into the pond, but the ripple has not yet reached the end and it's going to be a journey. So we all need to work together and get on this. Um, so my, my goal, for running the Senate or running for Senate was to get into that position and then work with all these people and try to make a difference that way. So that's my introduction. And I'm, and, and I'm Billy's protege. So I'll, I'll throw that out there. So if you guys have anybody that you know that's struggling um, on the verge that's suicidal or struggling with addiction, do you have anything you would want to tell them? Um, can I ask you? Sure. So Wait so a sec. I'm going to be here. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I have depression, which is a lifelong war. Uh, it doesn't go away. It doesn't stop. It's, it's consistent. And uh, I am actually, and I'm going to say this very publicly, in the middle of a relapse. Um, you don't notice... When, when you have depression, well, for me personally, you don't really notice that you are in a relapse until you're really into it. And the first step for me, um, you know, when I was younger, I'll start when I was younger, depression, uh, ADHD, there was this huge stigma around it. Um, I was a bad kid. It wasn't uh, that's that's what I was labeled. I was a bad kid. I spent more time in the hallway than I did in the classroom uh, because I would talk a lot. Um, I wasn't a bad kid. I, I wasn't. I just learned differently, and people didn't understand that. When it came to depression, it was a shake it off mentality. Uh, it's not real. It's in your head. Uh, you know, everybody gets sad every once in a while. That type of stuff. And trying to get help when you're younger. And I'd say about 12. Uh, it's, it was very difficult. Um, one of the things we're talking about is through art. And art is so important to me. Uh, Billy can tell you, I started writing poetry when I was 12. And one of the first things I remember writing was, life is a journey uh, that you're walking on your way to death. Pinch yourself, it's time to wake up. At 12 years old. At 12 years old, I was thinking about suicide. Um, that should be so telling. So uh, through poetry, I found a therapeutic outlet. And actually, it's kind of, I look back and laugh because, uh, you know, one of my teachers has, had found one of my notebooks that I left in class and actually reached out to my parents because, you know, and uh, still that stigma was there. We, right now, being in the middle of a relapse, I'm telling you, it, it's a, I, can, I will bounce back. I, I always do, but it comes and goes. So when I was probably in my early 20s, um, I read a book, and I believe it was called Emotional Freedom. Don't quote me on that. 
and it opened my eyes and this is this may sound callous but it's not meant that way uh but the premise was that the you know being happy or being sad is a choice and like i said it may sound callous but to me at that time it made me think do i want to be sad all the time because i was an artist <clears throat> some of my best and billy could probably tell you because uh when i started rapping uh rhythm and poetry uh when i started rapping a lot of my a lot of my music was very uh down it was very you know uh depressed if you know and sad it's just the reality of life so when I read that book, Emotional Freedom, and it said, hey, you know, you have a choice, I had to take a look at myself and say, do I really want to feel this way? Because everything that I did that my mind would tell me to do, like, you don't feel like working out, Zach. You don't feel like hanging out with friends. You don't feel like getting up for school. You don't feel like doing this. My mind would, compl like, tell me every single thing uh, to, like, not do every single thing that I needed to do in order to get better. So when I read that book, it opened my eyes and I said, you know what? Nah, I don't want to feel like this. I don't want to be sad. From there, I took a journey that started there and will continue the rest of my life. Um, I've established routines and things like that. So <clears throat> um, one important part is communicating uh, when you have depression because depression is not just me. It's not just me. My, whole, my entire family, all my friends, it, it impacts all of them. Uh, so you need to communicate with them, talk to them, let them know what you're going through. It's cool. It's fine. Like, it is okay not to be okay. I know that's a cliche now, but it is so important that you understand that because that's just, that's number one. You have to be okay with understanding that there's something going on. So during this, you know, I probably, I probably realized that I was going through my relapse um, probably about two days ago, to be honest with you. I just, it clicked. I was like, whoa, uh, you're sleeping, you're oversleeping, you're not eating, you are, um, your, your brain's foggy. You know, I, I got here a little late, for example. So as soon as I realized that, that's step one. And then step two is, getting everything your your mind tells you that you don't feel like doing you need to do it so i started working out again now i'm eating right uh now i'm making more time for my friends things like that and i at 20 years old uh, i did try to kill myself um i took a bottle of Tylenol pms and i hopped on like 30 i don't know 30 30 whatever it was 31 and uh I mean, it's kind of metaphorical or whatever, but I drove past a graveyard uh, as I was driving. And uh, I looked over, and I realized that's where you're going to be. And I pulled over and just started throwing up. And um, luckily, I'm still here. I have no idea why I'm still here, but I am still here. And I thank God every day that I'm still here because the things that I thought were the end of the world were not. And if I would have ended it there, I have done so much for our community and I've done so much for, you know, myself. And at 20, if I was gone, none of that would have happened. I would have never done and made the, shit, the impact that I did on so many lives. So if, that, if there's one thing I can say, it's don't give up. Um, be self-aware. If you're going, you, you can get better. You will get better. It's, it's a battle. You're going to be doing it your entire life, and you're going to get busy, and you're going to think, hey, I can get out of these routines that help me uh, with my mental health. As soon as you get out of those routines, you're going to get right back into it. You can't. You have to make time for health, your mental health. That is number one. If you don't make time for yourself and your health, you're no good for your family. And if you're no good for your family, you're no good for your job, and you're not going to do well in your career. So um, I appreciate that little open discussion there. Uh, I know that was a little heavy to start with, but um, that's that's what I wanted to do. And music and has helped me tremendously. Um, being able to put my feelings down, get into the booth and just and rap and just and and just let it all out. Uh, there's no better outlet for me. So the experience of art is just there's 
I can't say enough of how therapeutic it can be. So I'm not going to monopolize everybody's time. So I'll pass the mic. So one of the things I would say is that to remember that there are resources available. Um, we have Carroll County Mobile Crisis Unit, and they can be reached at 410-952-9552. And we also have the new 988, which is the uh, what 211 uh, is turning into. Was, um, going to be, they have, you have access to them 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year um, to be able to talk to someone. Um, and just like Zach said, it's, it's okay to not be okay um, and to make sure that you are taking care of yourself. So if I could share anything, um, personal experience would be that as we talk about um, hope, and despair. So when you have no hope, you are at despair. And it's an old cliche that we found to be true. Some of them we put in a box and throw out the window because it's not true. But this one is, desperate people do desperate things without the proper guidance. That's a reality and a fact of life. So when we don't have hope, you're going to fall into despair. And oftentimes we hear a lot about substance abuse. Typically the whole substance abuse is a way people tend to use to anesthetize whatever is going on with them. For me, it's Tylenol. I suffer with anxiety. But I know that if I don't get my rest, it's going to agitate my respiratory condition. That's going to leave me feeling hopeless to accomplish the task for the next day, sometime the next moment, because I need to be able to articulate. I work with students, and a lot of them are looking towards me to be able to help them understand in very minute ways whatever the lesson calls for. So personally, for me, it could be Tylenol. It may not be heroin, it may not be oxycodone, it may not be any of those, because see, I believe the hype. In my day, Lynn Bias died the first time he tried cocaine. So I'm the girl who believes the hype. If you testify of it to me, I'm going to believe you. So I'm not going that route, I'm very teachable. But for me, it's Tylenol. I haven't made the leap to Tylenol PM, but I understand that when you take medication, other than how it, how it is prescribed, you are abusing the medication. So it's a slippery slope. For me, I retained a therapist. My therapist is helping me retain a psychiatrist. If I need medication, to help me deal with the anxiety, I need to seek out a professional, right? One of the things I learned from NAMI many years ago is that when we start feeling all of this hopelessness, it may be a sign of a brain disorder or something you were born with, right? So we are so thankful that we're in the 21st century, that we have all this technology that can verify the science of what's going on with us, and we don't have to worry about other people saying, well, it's just all in your head, because science now verifies it outright, and we're only in the 21st century. So for me, that's my story. Now, here's something interesting. I gotta share this. Six years ago, we lost our mother, four girls, and of course, she was the best thing since, you know, God himself invented Jesus Christ, of course. We lost our mother. On the sixth day, preparing for her funeral, signing off on everything, Lillian, the founder of Brown Safe Haven, gets a phone call, and her son has passed away as a result of a respiratory condition. So within six days, she's lost her mother and her only son, which is her only child. To me, I still don't know how she copes with that because I know I would be doing some inpatient care at one of the institutions at least twice a year. And it's not a joke, it's just the reality of my mental state. 
I've learned that we're all different. Again, this is personal testimony. So what somebody else can manage emotionally or mentally, wonderful. I or my sister may not be able to handle it. Some of us already have these um, extenuated circumstances, right, that we're born with chemically, imbalances, brain disorder, brain disease, brain damage, um, that causes us not to respond to the vicissitudes of life. I don't care who you are. The church says, keep on living. You're going to face your mountain that's too hard to climb. And that's where I found, and my sister and I have found, that you have to reach out to professionals. We reach out to professionals when, we, um, when our toe doesn't heal, heal properly, or when we have a hangnail that doesn't quite heal properly, when we've attached our eyelashes and we're having some problems with our eyes, we reach out for a professional. It is the same when we talk about despair, when we talk about not going through the process of grief and it never ending. So they have these health professionals, right? Um, mental health professionals. They have these people who've already been there, done it, me too, who can support us as, we going, as we're going through our time of despair. And despair is not the same as being sad for a day or two. It is to feel hopeless. You don't see an end in sight. Therefore, if there's no end in sight, what difference does it make to even continue Last story, I don't know if you all remember Rick Warren, The Purpose Driven Life. At his highest point, his son who suffered with mental illness decided that there was no hope. So he was in the depths of despair and he committed suicide. But in his letter, he said, there is no hope. So we know the facts are out there that when people feel hopeless, they're two steps, three steps, four steps closer to suicide. Final point I want to say here, I have a Facebook page that is supposed to encourage women, women, sage, encouraging women, and I posted Judith's um, information, share hope through heart, deaths of despair, and an older woman in her 70s said, what in the world is that, deaths of despair? I hadn't even thought of that somebody would not know what it is. Deaths of despair. Anything that pushed you to the point that you have no hope. It doesn't have to be an alcohol or a substance abuse addiction. It could be the loss of a loved one that you literally just can't get over. You've gone through the grieving process, but you can't see yourself living without that loved one. You don't have any hope of being able to live your life. You're in the place of despair. So sometimes as we come to these gatherings, the focus seems to be on these issues of um, substance abuse. But that's not the issue. The issue is mental health, or we like to say mental wellness, getting us to a place of being well mentally so that we can make amazing decisions. Brian Safe Haven realizes that when you don't eat, you don't have food, you don't have nutrition, when you are hungry, you're not able to make the best decision at the very minimum. So for Brian Safe Haven, it is the goal that people would not have to worry about being hungry in the surrounding communities. People would not have to worry about how they're going to get government assistance. Miss Hardy is able to help you navigate that process. And I can go on and on and on because I know that mental, you can slip, it's a slippery slope from what we call sane to insanity, from what we call hopeful to despair. Back to the question of how would you address that if someone is suicidal? It's a very, very deep, profound discussion. And I would say, one is to make sure that you are in a place where you could spend that time and energy with that individual. One of, I, I heard you say, 
all of you have the theme has been hope and having hope. And in NAMI, that is our last principle of support, is never give up hope. Suicidal thinking is a very temporary state. That person that is feeling suicidal is very ambivalent if they have one person to intervene to say, can you tell me about it? What can I offer you right now on a personal level? And you really do need to spend that time and energy with that individual. If you need to call emergency services, that's okay. Everything that you are doing is being available. And I can assure you, I mean, just from my experience in the past five years, Plus, I mean, even in the critical care in the, when I worked in the, in the hospital, when a person was feeling suicidal, just having a person to have a pair of ears to listen and the presence. And I'm talking about your 100% presence. You could just sit on the edge of the bed and let them cry, let them shout, let them throw tissue boxes. I've had tissue boxes thrown at me. I mean, whatever it is that's going on with that person, allow them that and then get them whatever help, but in the moment you're offering yourself, your spirit and your heart. And I can assure you that is huge in the moment. Um, anyone who is going through despair, um, who cannot see the light because they can't see three minutes into the future, um, it, is is seriously blindsided by their current situation where they they can't breathe um, because things are just so enormous in their head um, that they can't even talk um, that's when you do have to sit there for how many ever hours it takes say the wrong things um, but uh, help them just sit and breathe and ride that storm out with them. Um, that's the way that people need you to be present. Um, and it's very hard to be present for somebody who's feeling like Suzanne. People say, who's Suzanne? In the opening scene of Jaws, you got this poor woman being ripped around left and right by a shark. She's in pain and she's not in control. Um, when people feel like Suzanne, and occasionally we all do, um, the only thing you can do is be there for them in any way that it helps them and realize that it's not about you. They're, they may lash out at you for being there, but it's because they see you as a safe haven and it's going to take them a while to navigate back to being able to breathe again. Um, so anybody who is in a situation, whether you're a caregiver or an, a, a person who just feels like they can't breathe, the, the best next step is to take a breath and then look up or do something different that you've never done before or go talk to somebody you've never talked to before or go to a location you've never been to before because there's different new things out there. There are resources to help you re-gear and regrow and breathe again. We're here for you. I don't have the same wealth of knowledge as some of these other people have, but I have a lot of experience. Um, growing up between overdoses and suicides, well, with suicides, I've lost about six close friends that, you know, grew up with me inside of my house. And from overdoses and, and suicide with outside friends, I probably lost close to 50 to 60 different people. Um, that was growing up. So me at this age, I became, like she was saying, I became an ear for people. I've literally pulled over and grabbed people from the middle of the freeway and put them in my car. I've sat and for hours and hours on the, on the telephone or in front of people crying, kids, adults, people I looked up to. And um, I just became a, a ear for people. And um, that's how I got like so much experience and learning about that and different teens that were going through um, 
I guess just at that teenage year when you, you're starting to find yourself, like, especially when COVID happened, I dealt with a countless amount of kids. So um, I wasn't prepared for that that question until I, I, was, I was listening to what everybody else said and I, I realized how involved I actually really was with suicide prevention and how many people I've actually helped save. So um, I, to, to the people that are suffering through things, uh, you got to find somebody to talk to and be okay to be open and, you know, you got to find somebody that, that, that you can trust but be okay to be open and really, really, you know, tell your story and tell them what's going on. That could alter that thought and that you know within those couple seconds you might change your mind yes well i wanted to thank all of you so much for coming and sharing um i hope somebody ends up watching this now and probably a lot of people later um so i guess to answer the same question um I've been suicidal, and what stopped me was uh, my neighbor, who I was friends with, a sister, he passed by suicide in 2003. And um, so fast forward to 2011, um, sorry, I'm <laughs> I can arrange a meeting. I'm like, I, I like being behind the camera so much. <laughs> um, thank you. But um, so 2003, after the funeral of my neighbor, my dad said, this is the worst thing that can happen to a parent. Um, and that kind of just resonated. Because uh, when you are in that despair, your mind is telling you it's never going to get better. Um, you're, I, I talk about it in one of my books. It's like the crappy pit of despair. You think it's never going to get better. You think if you reach out to anybody, you're going to drag them into that pit with you and hurt them. You start to think that the world would be better without you. So that's why with Ignite, my title is The World is Better With You In It, because all those are lies. Um, Yes, yeah, sometimes people need new friends that can deal with like reality and aren't in denial. You know, th there's people that walk around with denial and you're like, like they, they, you know, but um, that's another topic. But um, there's good friends, there's solid friends that exist. Um, and sometimes, you know, you need to change your environments. I have a book, Crap Happens Philosophy, and it's about um, crap happening, but you can turn it into fertilizer and grow something beautiful out of it. So it's, it was originally like in a state of anger. I'm bipolar and I've, I've been involuntarily hospitalized and all that stuff. So I wrote it in anger, like people are so crappy. But then I'm like, in my healing journey, I'm like, no, but you gotta say like, I started reading more and I'm like, no, it can be turned into fertilizer. And like, you know, my story can help somebody, maybe. Like, but I like I just was in the NAMI blog last week with my, my um, in our own voice story, so I'm like, I don't know if it will, but it's like, it's um, kind of an exciting life to be like, maybe I'll help somebody, you know? Um, and I'm so glad each, thank you, thank you. And I'm so glad each of you are here, so thank you. I'm like, because um, when you're in that despair, it's like when, you, when you're thinking that and having those racing thoughts and you're not sleeping and you're not eating and you're picturing your end, do put yourself in the hospital. Um, like if you, you know, because I was at the point where it was like, I was ready to drive somewhere, I had a, combination I knew how to you know get to something that's usually locked up like you know I knew how to get to everything and I'm like I just kept picturing it and picturing it and the plan and it's like my brother was like oh you can just come stay with us but then I'm like but every house has dangerous objects and what if I did it in front of him and his family and like you know because I'm like you know um, so I put myself in the hospital and there's a lot of stigma that comes with it and being not diagnosed bipolar has a whole slew of stigma because um, sometimes they're like, you're really agitated. Are you manic? And then I'm like, no, I'm just agitated. <laughs> so there's this the whole part is we are beginning to normalize the conversation. We are. Yes. From five years ago to today, I can really see a difference. And please, this panel and folks that are out there, continue to talk about it every day. Don't just ask somebody, how are you? How are you really? Mm -hmm. And listen for the answer. And you're going to be really surprised at how people are going to answer. I bet you that I'm, I would feel absolutely certain that the majority of the people in this room have thought about suicide at least once. Because there are so many things that happen that make us feel like we can't cope. 
and the topics all thank you and the topics often um mental health and i'm kind of like maybe it has to do with our culture too like <laughs> The American dream is a little bit like um, unachievable by the vast majority. It's like, you know, hand me down clothes. I did buy this shirt for my, um, the world is better with you in it for my birthday, but um, almost everything I wear someone gave me. Uh, you know, but it's um, try, trying to keep up with the Joneses. I was like, eh, yeah, you know, but um, it's. And for it, what? And <laughs> for, for what? And really? Something that, talk about normalizing the conversation, and, and Billy can probably speak to this too, because I mean, we look at the dude, he's, he's super tough. Um, but as men, boys, uh, we're told, you know, you're not allowed to be weak, you're not allowed to cry, you're not allowed to do this, so you're not allowed to do that. So most of my friends, my closest friends, are women, um, because they have been there for me. Uh, they've always been there for me to listen. I felt comfortable talking to them, and uh, I love them to death. They know who they are. Um, but yes, so normalizing the conversation, we have a culture of toxic masculinity, um, and it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, and you know, a lot of people, um, very influential people in the area, uh, you know, at one point in time, we had a group, a men's group where we could actually go in a safe space and talk about these things. And people in this room, uh, you know, were very influential, very important, and you would never think in a million years that they were dealing with this stuff. But we were able to open up and talk about this kind of stuff. And that needs to, that conversation needs to happen among men. Um, because, it, you know, it, that, that stigma that we're tough all the time is, is just total crap. Um, and like I said, you know, someone like Billy, like, I, like Billy, you know, raps, I, you know, rapped, and I'm still waiting for that 16, by the way. Um, but, uh, you know, especially like coming up and being a rapper, it's like, no, you can't have any weaknesses. You, you're, you just gotta be tough all the time. Um, and it's not real, it's not true, and, uh, us as men, we got it. We got to change. We really do, and we got to continue to change. And the next generation is making me happy to see the acceptance, the love, the you know. Um, and and I want to keep seeing that move forward because we're all individuals. We all um, my trauma growing up. I you know I was upper middle class. Uh, my family we didn't hurt for money. My my father worked very very hard. Uh, however, I was not accepted by those that were upper middle class. Um, my friends were Billy and, uh, you know, the, the uh, people that were less fortunate. So what was my trauma compared to their trauma? I had no trauma in my mind, you know, but I did. It just was not their trauma. And the, the you know, again, like, oh, it's a cut. It doesn't hurt. Uh, you know, that person lost their arm. Uh, why do I? What am, what am I supposed to be upset about? No empathy. <laughs> right. Zero it, it, it doesn't matter. Like you, you know, trauma to you and trauma to someone else, it's still trauma. And so never compare yourself or your trauma to someone else's because that's what I did for a very long time and said, why am I complaining when there are people starving? Why am I upset when, you know, I have all these things going for me? Uh, I have no right to be. That's not true. Uh, I do have trauma. And, uh, and I'm dealing with it. And uh, so I just wanted to bring that up uh, because that's incredibly important for men and for boys, you know, it's okay. It's okay to be open, express your empathy, uh, you know, and, and be caring. And I guess they call that my feminine side. Okay, let's do it, you well, know? And also <laughs> hey, the, I'm all about it. Also the wordage, weakness, Weakness is not a weakness. Weakness is vulnerability. So let's use the right word. What we see is you are strong for sharing this stuff where some people say, oh, but I'm weak. You're not weak. Amen. You're strong yes, because you're sharing your vulnerability. Yes, so what I, what I hear, <laughs> what, this is what we'll I hear do. being shared here that we don't have to be tough. I said that one time to my therapist, I don't want to be tough. I always was considered the tough guy. I want to be strong. Mm -hmm. So 
There's a scripture that says, in our weakness, we are then made strong. But if you're trying to be tough, nobody even can sympathize with you because you're the tough guy. At, at what but cost? At what cost? Um, I want to just say this for sake, time's sake. Like, tag, and share if you're watching the live, right? Yeah. Like, tag, and share. Because the whole purpose of this event here is not for those of us who are sitting here because we are the support resources. We want you all to like, tag, and share so that others in the community can help us raise awareness. True, Margaret Mead said, anything that has ever been done in a big way That's has fine. been done <laughs> That's fine. That's by fine. a very small group of people. So we can just take this small group here on Facebook Live, but you gotta like, tag, and share so that the message get out there that there is no longer a stigma behind wanting to be mentally healthy. We call it mental health, but we're sick. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and everything is energy. And everything, everything is energy. And so every organization here is a beacon of hope because that's what this session is all about. Hope. Every organization serves as a beacon of hope, almost like an inoculation, right? It gets you ready for whatever is coming. Like this gentleman said, that you yourself, oh my God, I just can't get over NAMI over 18 years ago, letting my students know this one guy, peer to peer NAMI said, he, he was in his 30s then, but he realized at 12 on the stage during his speech, something was not the same. So if a kid can realize that and know that they know them own selves, and if you like, tag, and share, they can access information on their own. So I just want to say, can we all say um, hope? Hope. 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 Hope, hope is here. Never yes. Give up hope. No more deaths food. I'm talking to Judith. This is her thing yes. here. But I'm serious about this because um, when things have happened to you, even if you were the one that was wrong, like you committed a heinous crime, right? And justice was served, because we're talking about this for everybody. No deaths through despair. You feel like there's no hope because everybody's mad at you. You really hurt somebody. So how do we help that person? Because we're all justified in being mad at that person. But that person still deserves, after receiving justice, to have hope. So and I think that's the message that we really are trying to get out here, that you can have hope and kind of back paddle your way out of despair. And each one of these organizations here, they serve as an inoculation to help you in your process. Because it is a journey, and it is a process, but the bottom line is, it's different for each one of us. And again, I so appreciate you allowing us to come here and share as a group. Thank you. Let's give a hand to Judy. Yes. And thank you to all of you. This was amazing. I hope we can go Facebook Live and also, we are going Facebook Live, but I also have another camera I hope to edit. Um, so the goal is, if, so I think like a writer, and I actually do like behind, being behind the camera, but um, if we're writing a story, our goal is to have a chapter on a time when there were deaths of despair. What? People did what? Mm -hmm. So we're in the chapter of trying to make that chapter exist. So I'm hoping by the time I'm 90, it's like, already in the history books. Maybe by the time I'm even 60, like, or 50, hey, that'd be awesome. Just turn 40. So the goal, the goal is um, just making this part of history. Like, every life matters, and the world is better with you in it. And thank you guys so much for your time. Um, we're going to end Facebook Live in the video and check time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much.